Grab your Bibles now. Grab your Bibles, open to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. If you are, uh, if you got a Bible from one of the ushers, that's page 1076. 1076 Galatians chapter 3. As you're turning there, we are um, seeing what, what God says through Paul to a group of Christians that are confused about salvation. Confused about how a person goes from death to life. How a person goes from lost to to found, from darkness to light, from, from, from being under the law to being under grace, from being lost to being saved. And so uh, this section, as you're going to see in a minute, is uh, challenging to say the least. But what we are going to see in this passage is some critical things that every single one of us needs to know in order to understand why we can't earn our salvation. So we're going to jump into that. So keep that in mind as I read. So go ahead and please stand if you're able. We stand in recognition that these are God's words, not my own. Galatians chapter 3, let's start in verse 13, all right? God says to us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. The law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But Scripture imprisoned everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That's God's word. You may be seated. And as you're seated, join me in praying one more time. God, we need the truth that is here. But the truth that is here is not, is not laying on the surface. It requires us to dig. It requires us to deal with some, some things that you expected us to understand, some things that we um, often don't. And so please help us this morning to understand your truth. Not just understand what it says, but understand how it, how it applies to our own lives. And help us, please, to understand how it puts Jesus on a pedestal so we can see how wonderful he is and so we can help others do the same thing. That is the goal of preaching, that people see how wonderful Christ is and give their lives to him as a result. I pray that you would do that here in our church this morning. I pray that you would do that at Compass Christian Church in Chandler. I pray that you would use Pastor Roger there this morning to make much of Christ so that the hundreds and even thousands of people that are going to hear him this, this weekend are drawn to the beauty of Christ. See how wonderful you are, Jesus, so that people give their lives, fall on their face in repentance and faith in you. That'd be evidence of your grace there. That'd be evidence of your blessing and that you are using them to make an impact in this community for you. And so would you do that there, please? Would you do that here? Help us to see how wonderful you are, Jesus, in the preaching and understanding of your word. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Well, if you're on the prayer team here, you know that this has been a, uh, you've worked a lot this week. You've been, you've been working. We've got members and we've, we've had others who've been in the hospital for infections, for surgeries. We've had all kinds of crazy things going on this week. And so there's been a lot being pumped to our prayer team. If you're interested in the prayer team, just take out the connect card, put prayer team, drop it in a giving box as you leave. But uh, you, there, there's been a lot of time spent by our members in the hospital this week. And so I want you to imagine going to the hospital. You need, you need surgery, let's say, for, for your 
your leg. And so you, you've blown out your knee and uh, you need surgery. And as you're talking to the doctor who's going to perform the surgery, you're finding out some insights about who they are, their training, all of that. And during the course of your conversation, the, the doctor says, oh, I, I don't know much about medicine. I just love surgery. In that moment, you might be like, uh, I don't know about this. I'm not sure I feel comfortable with this. Well, I've told you the story about being in college and having a having my, my first day in a theology class, and we're all sitting down and getting situated, and the teacher opens class, says, welcome to Theology 1, the doctrine of the Bible, and, and, and my professor was interrupted as a girl jumps up out of her seat and says, I'm in the wrong class. You know, and this very godly, older gentleman, my professor said, uh, well, my dear, would you like to study theology with us this semester? And she goes, I don't need theology. I just love Jesus. Ran out the door. Uh, who knows where? I ran out the door and we didn't, never saw her again. Now we laugh at that, but this is, this is how most of us live, right? We don't do too many things that stretch us. We don't, we don't do things that, that cause us to really like hone in on things. And go, like, I really need to know this. Whether, and that's physically, we don't stretch ourselves emotionally, intellectually, and even spiritually. And when, when we bring that comfort thing into our relationship with God, and when we bring that mentality into our commitments to Jesus, we read passages like this one that are hard to understand, and we go, I'm going to keep going. Where's the stuff about God has a wonderful plan for my life? Like, and so this is going to be a difficult message. It's not difficult in the truth, I don't think, but it's going to be difficult because God expects that you and I have information that many of us don't have. It's going to assume that, that we have a knowledge, particularly of two, not not minor events in the Old Testament, but two of the most important events in the Old Testament, it's going to assume that we have that information. It's going to assume that we understand what the book of Genesis and Exodus is all about. And so we're going to need to do a little background. But like in the first service, I was wearing a sweater. I was like, oh, you know, feeling comfortable. But between services, I realized I needed to roll up my sleeves, that I need to dig in and go, no, we, we really need to see what's in this text. Because this text, if we do the hard work of saying, okay, I'm going to push past the surface. I'm going to dig into the detail. I'm going to find out what is in this book. What is in this passage? It's going to help your life. It's going to, it's going to not just help your life because you're going to understand God's word better. But your understanding of God's word is going to help you help other people. And here's what I mean by that. The book of Galatians is written to a group of churches in southern Turkey that were that, that were hearing teaching about Jesus, and it sounded right to them. It sounded good to them. It sounded like something that they should embrace wholeheartedly, and it went like this. Believe in Jesus, obey the law, and you'll be saved. Not, not the Constitution, not, not the laws of Rome, but God's law, the first five books of the Old Testament, the, what's called the Law of Moses. Believe in Jesus, obey the law, and you'll be saved. Faith plus works equals salvation. And, and the, the, the guys who taught that said, look, we love Jesus, we're into Jesus, it's all about Jesus, but they showed through using the Old Testament that it's faith plus works equals salvation. Now, as I've been telling you, this is what most people believe. This is what most people in church, this is what most people outside of church, this is what most people on the planet believe. That if I'm just, if I believe that God exists and I'm a good person, then I'll go to heaven. That, that it's pretty simple. Trust some deity, trust some religious figure, prove it by your good works and you'll be saved. So here's, as I told, as I said last week, when Paul heard this, he understood what we don't understand. We think all that we need is like a tweet or a or a uh, a status update. Works cannot save you. Period. You know, and then that's it. But what Paul understands is what we don't understand is that the attack against salvation by faith alone is not surface. It's not easy. People bring their their entire mental faculties to just to try to destroy this idea that you and I cannot earn our salvation. It is not possible that you and I bring nothing to our salvation but our sin, and that's it. We we tend to want to add something to it because of our sinful hearts. We as Christians want to add something to it because we know obedience is, is important, but how it all fits is, is something that Paul goes, you have to know this. And let me back up and say it's not just Paul that says this, 
This is God arguing through Paul, right? Because this is God's word. So this isn't Paul's argument, oh, he's just some smart guy 2,000 years ago. This is God telling you and me, we need to know these arguments because these are sophisticated arguments back at us that say, no, it's works and faith. You know, like, like Islam, right? Believe in Allah, believe in the prophet, believe, believe in God and do the good works of the prophet and you'll be saved, right? This is the message of Mormonism. Believe in Jesus, do a bunch of stuff the prophet said and you'll be saved. This is the message of Roman Catholicism. Believe in Jesus, do a bunch of stuff the church says, and you'll be saved. This is, the, this is the religion of every false religion. This is the beliefs of every false form of Christianity. Believe in Jesus and add stuff to that belief, and you'll be saved. So my point here is that what we're talking about this morning is not 2,000 years old. It is as relevant as tomorrow's newspaper. How do we, you and I need to be able, not just to know, can't earn your salvation. You and I need to be able to pick up this book with your friends who believe that they can earn their salvation. You and I be able to pick up this book and go, open your, I want you to see Galatians chapter three. I want, I want to be able to show you what this is all about. And now you might think, well, you know, what you said about Rome, like they don't really believe that, but they really do. In August of last year, Pew Research Center, they do surveys on religion they did a survey of American Christianity, and the question that they asked was this. Blank is needed to get into heaven. Okay, There's, That's the survey question, and they gave two options. Faith in God alone is needed to get into heaven, or both good deeds and faith are needed to get into heaven. This was their question. Okay, Very simple, two answers. What happens? Well, 81% of Catholics said, both good deeds and faith is needed to go to heaven, which is not surprising. That's Catholic theology. That's, that's like, duh, of course, faith plus works equals salvation. That's what they believe. But what about Protestants? What, what did they put? You know, people who self-identified as Protestants, people who say, no, it's not, it's not, it, it, I'm not Catholic, I'm a Protestant, I'm protesting something, I don't know what. Um, what were their answers? Those who said, those who self-identified as Protestants and also said it's both good deeds and faith that are needed to get into heaven were 52%. A majority of American Protestants tell us that the Galatian heresy is alive and well in the modern day. Now, Protestantism is a movement that started on this issue, that the only thing that is needed all that is needed to get into heaven, all that is needed to be right with God, all that is needed to be saved is faith. And that faith has to be alone, meaning no good work, not a bunch, not even one good work can supplement that. It must be faith alone. So if you look at chapter three, verse one of Galatians, what you see is that most people in church this morning are bewitched. And what God does is he equips now, most of the people that you know are never going to be here. So they're never going to hear me say that. So what this is for is God taking his word to equip you to reach them, to help them see, to use the arguments that God gives here to say, no, wait a minute. Let's take a look at what God says about this. Open your Bibles to Galatians 3. Let, let me show you that, God, that, that, that most people are tricked they may be even convinced that, that by an idea that God flatly rejects, uh, an idea that receives his curse, that they can earn their salvation by their good deeds, that they can earn some of it or earn all of it by their good deeds. So when the Galatian heresy is alive in our day, then what we need, what you and I need, is the same thing that Paul gave us. We need his arguments. And these arguments are difficult. They're going to stretch us. But that's good. So you ready to roll up your sleeves now? Ready to jump into the text? Okay, take a look at verse 15. As, as we, we read this passage, what we're going to see is there it is, there's a distinction between grace and works. Grace is the promises. We, we saw that in this passage that I read seven times, this word promise is used. The, the underlying idea of a promise is that it's grace, and it's contrasted in this passage with law. So grace promises, law punishes. Law says you must do, grace says 
God already did. The law threatens and the law condemns. Grace comforts and encourages and saves. So grace is superior because it saves. Law is inferior because it can't save. It only damns. That's Paul's point as we jump into this passage. And we're going to start this passage in verse 15, if you're taking notes, with this idea, the superiority of grace. The superiority of grace. That's the big idea, verses 15 to 18. Grace is God's favor, right? We all know what grace is. God's undeserved favor, God's unmerited favor. It's favor against what we deserve. It's God being kind to us and showing us favor and blessing in spite of what we deserve. It's not based on any of our good deeds. It's not God saying, I'm going to be nice to you because you obeyed me. That's not grace. Grace is, I'm going to be nice to you in spite of what you've done to me. Again, seven times in this passage, that see, grace is seen in the word promise. Now let's talk about the superiority of grace. Look at verse 15. Paul says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Stop right there. And we read that, we use a lot of language that we might not understand or, or we're familiar with, but this is very easy to understand. Let me ask you this. Did anybody have this experience? You went and bought a car. Let's say you paid $20,000 for it. And then and, uh, you signed the contract. And then after, the, after you signed the contract, the dealer says, I changed my mind. I want $50,000. Anyone have that experience? No, right? He goes, that doesn't happen in real life. That's the point here. Once the contract is signed, it's unchangeable. It's unalterable. This is the argument. So Paul's argument is this. If that's what's true in human affairs, well, that's true in God's affairs. Look at verse 17. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years after, after the promise God made to Abraham, the law which came 430 years afterwards does not know a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Okay, well, what's that all about? Well, here's where things get complex. Here's where you're going to get stretched. Okay, so there are two things you need to keep in mind in order to understand the passages I just read. Two covenants, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses and, and the Jewish people, okay? These are not minor events in the Old Testament. These are Everest events. These are important events. And I want you to see them for yourself. So turn to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, this is the covenant God makes with Abraham. This is the covenant of promise. And what I want you to see, Genesis 15, 15, page 12 in the Bible from the ushers. Genesis 15, what I want, to, want you to see in this is that God does not demand anything from Abraham. All God does is give promise after promise after promise after promise. Now notice, when you start in Genesis 15, look at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. That Abraham's name hasn't been changed yet. That's chapter 15, it's chapter 17 came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Okay. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Drop down to verse 4. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man is, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And then God brings him outside and says, Look toward the heaven. And number the stars if you're able to number them. Then God said to Abram, so shall your offspring be. Look at the, look at the stars. That's how many offspring you're going to have. And notice verse 6, important verse. And he believed the Lord. And God counted it to him as righteousness. And God said to him, I am the Lord. I'm the Lord who brought you out of the earth of Chaldees to give you this land to possess. But he said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And now God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. That's all the imagery that we're going to see right here. That's what God is doing. It's covenant time. Verse 9, and he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. What's going to happen? Verse 10, and he brought him all these cut them in half, picture that, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. So we've got cow carcass, a goat carcass, a ram carcass, and two birds, okay? Verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. 
Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Do you know what that's talking about? That's Egypt. That's the Exodus, okay? But I shall bring judgment on the nation, and they shall serve, and that they shall serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So this is Charlton Heston. This is the, this is the prince of Egypt, right? That, that's what he's describing here. Now, now go over to verse 17. Then the sun had, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Those are images of God's presence. Behold, they, they uh, passed between the pieces. So there's, where's Abraham at this moment? He's snoring, right? He's taking a nap. He's not there. God himself goes between the pieces. God himself makes the covenant. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to a sleeping Abraham, someone who cannot do anything about it, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So the point here is this. This covenant that God made with Abraham is unilateral, which means one party, which means you didn't see Abraham and God holding hands, walking through this together. One person, Abraham, that's it. Why? I'm sorry, God, that's it. Now, why is that important? Because what God is showing here is that the fulfillment of this covenant, that, that, that's going to make a lot of important impact in Galatians 3, the fulfillment of this covenant does not depend on human obedience because nobody, nobody else was there. It was the, This covenant completely depends on God's faithfulness. That's it. Okay, that's why only God went there. This, this covenant, by the way, was given by grace, meaning that Abraham didn't do anything to earn this. And what we see by God alone going through the animals is that this covenant is only fulfilled by grace. It is not fulfilled by law. So God binds himself. I am going to accomplish this for you. I'm going to give you this land and the other promises. I'm going to give you a great name. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And I'm going to take everything I'm doing for you and make that a great blessing to the entire world. That's what God promises. Now there's something else you need to see. Turn to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, God reiterates this. It's about, what does it say in 17.1? It's about 14 years later. So, so Abraham is not talking to God every second of every day. God, God shows up, talks to Abraham, and then he's gone for like 14 years, and then God comes back. And that's what we see here in chapter 17. So God reminds him, here's the covenant that I made with you. And I want you to see verse 19, because God describes this covenant in a very important way. How is this covenant that God made described? What does it say? 17, 19. This is a what? An everlasting covenant, which means that this covenant never loses force. It means that this covenant doesn't have an expiration date. It means what Paul says in Romans eleven twenty nine 29, when he said, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't take them back. God doesn't change them. They, these promises are just as eternal as God is. So I want you to think about this for a minute. This covenant of promise it's unilateral. It's given by grace. It's fulfilled by grace. It is eternal, which means it is unchanging. It's irrevocable. Nobody can touch this. Okay? Now, turn to second event. This is Exodus 19. Exodus 19, page 67. That was the covenant with Abraham. The rest of the Bible, by the way, is the outworking of that promise. So you will read at the end of the book of Revelation language that connects all the way back to this promise because it's not just the whole Bible, but all of history. The history we are in right now is God fulfilling this promise to Abraham as Gentiles are coming in, becoming sons of Abraham by faith in Christ. So now what we see here in Exodus 19 is something that happens about 700 years after this first promise to Abraham, okay? So you've got to think, okay, I know it just took us two seconds to go from Genesis 15 to Exodus 19. It took us like two seconds. But you have to think those two seconds equal 700 years. Think about 700 years ago. The 1400s, right? No. No, the 1300s. No toilets, no cell phones, 
I mean, imagine living here 1,400 years ago in July. Yeah, no thanks. Okay? So this is what you got to think. 700 years have passed between God giving this this covenant to Abraham and what we're going to read right here. Exodus 19. This is another Everest event. This is the giving of the law to Moses. This is the covenant with Moses. So look at chapter 19. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. Now, I want you to picture this in your head. Picture a mountain. You know, let's maybe picture like, you know, the superstitions or something, okay? So at the base of the superstitions is not a few hundred people. It's 2.5 million people, okay? So picture in your mind 2.5 million people. Think like Million Man March in Washington, something like lots of people, okay? And then Moses goes up the mountain. Verse 3. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So that's grace. I did all of that for you. Now look at verse 5. Now therefore, if you indeed will obey my voice and keep my covenant. Notice, now God is not saying, I will, I will, I will. Now he's saying, you will. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So notice what he does. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, set before them all the words the Lord had commanded them. Verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord had spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So there was a, did you notice the difference between the two? Do you notice the difference? That one was a lot of God saying, here are all the promises I'm going to make to you. And there was nothing that Abraham said in, by way of commitment. He just received it by faith. Here, God says, hey, I've got some things for you and uh, you need to obey. So what, what we see here is that unlike the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses is bilateral, meaning God and the people connect. This is like a marriage. This is, this is a bilateral commitment when two people make a commitment to do something. Well, this is, this is God saying, I'm going to do my part. And if you do your part, I will bless you. I'll make you a great nation. I will give you the land, all of those things. So God does his part. That's grace. The people do their part. That's works. So this is conditional. This is conditioned on obedience. If you, if I, if you obey, I will bless you. If you disobey, I will curse you. The covenant with Abraham, again, is God saying, I will, I will, I will. Covenant with Moses is God saying a lot of you will, you will, you will. One is grace, the other is works. Okay, God expects you and I to have that already. So now turn to Genesis, or Galatians 3. Galatians 3, let's look at verse 17 again. This is what I mean, Paul says. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. What does that mean? It means this. God makes the covenant to Abraham. He reminds Abraham's son Isaac. He reminds Abraham's grandson Jacob. The last time he, God reminds Jacob of the covenant he made with his grandpa uh, Abraham, that was 430 years before the Exodus when God says, I'm making a covenant with Abraham. So in total, Almost 700 years of people were saved by faith. 700 years of people. That's, that's a, that, that is Abraham, his family, Isaac, his family, all the way down to the Exodus. And by the time we get to Exodus, that's 2.5 million people. It's a lot of people that are saved by faith. And so what Paul is saying is this. Just like when you bought your house, let's say you paid 250 and the seller didn't come back and go, no, I want 300. So in the same way, when God says salvation is by a promise, the, 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 letter, the, the next covenant doesn't come along and go, yeah, I'm going to change that all now. It's not by a promise. It's by works. Paul says, no, you can't earn it. That's impossible. The first covenant takes precedence over the second. The second cannot change an eternal, everlasting covenant. Why? Because God doesn't change. And because God doesn't change, this first covenant does not change. So we're going to ask the question, well, why give the law then? But for now, the point is this. Grace stands. Grace is superior to the law 
because grace was given first. Because the false teachers are going to come along and go, well, here's what God did. You got Abraham and you got Moses. You got grace and you got works. So how are you saved? Grace and works. Abraham plus Moses equals salvation. That's what they think, that the law came and changed the terms of the agreement so that now you and I are saved by grace and works. Using the Bible, by the way, to prove that. This is what I mean. You and I need to be sophisticated in our understanding of the Bible. We need to be able to sniff that stuff out because they were using the Bible to disprove the Bible. They were using God's word to attack the gospel. And so Paul's saying, no, everybody, look at verse 18. The law can't add to or subtract from God's first and only way of salvation, which is grace and not law, verse 18. For if the inheritance, if the blessings, if salvation comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But salvation was always by promise. But God gave the promises to Abraham, gave, showed grace to Abraham by a promise. So what's the point? Ask your friends. Ask your family members. Ask the people you love most. Ask your kids. Do you have everything you need to go to heaven? Ask them the same question that the Pew Research Center asked Christians. Do you have everything you need to go to heaven? You know what you're probably going to hear? I hope so. I'm working on it. Trying. I guess I'll find out when I get there. Right? Like this is what you're going to hear. And what does that reveal? It reveals that the Galatian heresy is still alive and well in their hearts. The law is the basis for their interaction with God, not grace. Grace understands that I can't possibly have what I need to go to heaven. In fact, God through Paul says, there is nothing good in me, Romans 7, 18. God says through Paul that all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. God through Paul says, there is none righteous, no, not one. All have turned aside, no one does good, not even one, Romans 3, 10 and 3, 12. Grace understands that Jesus has everything I need to go to heaven and all my trust is in him. All my trust is in, is in his gracious promise to save me. There is no hope here. Trust cannot be in my ability to earn it. it ha- and, and it's really easy to illustrate this. Think about it. We are talking about the difference here in Galatians 3, 15 and 18 between Earning a car by working and earn, saving your money versus being given a car. Like, that's easy, right? If you, if you earn the car, the result of that is like self-satisfaction. I, I earned the car, great. But if you're given the car, what is the result in your heart? It's gratitude. It's praise for the person that did that for you. That's why, that's why salvation has to be by grace alone, through faith alone. Because if it's, if it's by works, then, then we steal a little bit of glory from God and we get some glory for ourselves. But if salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, then the giver gets the glory, right? He gets all the attention. We get none of the attention. And that's the way it should be. Because we cannot earn this thing. And because we're not God, God is God. And he's the one that deserves all the attention. Well, the astute, you know, Bible all-star sitting here right now is going, wait a minute. I feel uncomfortable because you skipped verse 16. Right? I know some of you are here. I'm not going to skip anything. The only problem is this is the second complex stretching part of God's argument here through Paul. That uh, It's going to get you ready to talk to people about Jesus, but uh, let's, let's take a look at what's being said here. Look, look at verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. What the heck does that mean, right? In Genesis, let me, let me help you think through this for a second. In Genesis, throughout the promises that God made to Abraham, he often said, as we saw in, in Genesis 15, I'm making this promise to you and to your descendants after you. Now, the word offspring is like the word sheep, okay? If you have one sheep, it's sheep. If you have a hundred sheep, it's not sheeps, right? Right? 
It's just sheep, same word, singular, plural. And that's, that's the point here. And, and, and what, what Paul is getting at is that sometimes this vague word in the, in the Genesis is used for a whole bunch of people. Sometimes it's used for one person. I want to show you one example of this. Take a look at Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 to 18. Okay? Genesis 22, 17 to 18. I want you to notice the word offspring and the way that, that Moses is using it here to, to um, recount what God said to Abraham. Quote, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. So in that use of the word offspring, it's clearly plural. You're going to have as many offspring as sand in the seashore, stars in heaven. You're going to have a lot. Now notice this. And your offspring, you might think plural, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. What? What has happened there? Same word, but, but the, the word is being used to refer to a single offspring. He's going to possess the gate of his enemies, which means that his enemies are not going to be able to defeat him. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. There's the blessing to Abraham again. Let me, let me put that out there. And we've seen in Galatians, what is that blessing? It's being right with God by faith in Christ. Because you have obeyed my voice. So scholars see some of these singular offspring as hints of Jesus. And so Paul now brings this back in and says, wait a minute, this, this promise was not made to offsprings. It's not, it's not just made to descendants. It's made to the offspring, to Jesus. The promise is made to Abraham. In other words, are ultimately fulfilled in Christ, who, by the way, will fulfill the rest when he returns, the rest of the ones that aren't fulfilled yet. So Jesus, think about it this way, verse 16, Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, but he is the heir of all the promises, that God ever made. So Paul says, 2 Corinthians one uh, twenty, that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. So everything, every promise that God ever made is found in him. So where do you want to be? You want to be in him too. We'll get to that next week. But this, this subject of Christ is where, is where God went next with his argument against earning salvation. And we'll, we'll start this with the inferiority of the law, starting in verse 19. We've looked at the superiority of grace. It's a better covenant built on better promises, built on Christ and not Moses. It's built on grace and not works. Now we're going to see the inferiority of the law. This is where Paul goes. You might be thinking, if you've been here a couple of weeks, you might be going, you know, you've been really hammering on that law. You've been hammering on obedience in order to earn your salvation. So why did God give this stinking thing anyways? Why did he put this in the Bible? If it, if it doesn't help anybody get saved, then why is it even there? Take a look at verse 19. Why then the law? This is, he's anticipating this argument. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Stop right there. The first thing we see about the law is that the law is inferior because it's temporary. The law had an expiration date, and an expiration date was when Jesus came. When Jesus, specifically, when he died on the cross, the law ended. And, and what tells you that? Well, three things tell you that. First, on the night that Jesus died, he has this little ceremony with his disciples. And he says, the, this is the, the blood of, my, of the new covenant that is being instituted in my, in my blood. Like this is, this is something new now. This is the new covenant, and, and this is replacing the old covenant. Book of Hebrews is all about that. So the new covenant replaces this covenant with Moses, replaces it when Jesus dies. Second, when Jesus, when, what was the time that Jesus died? Do you remember? He died at 3 o'clock on Friday. Do you, do you remember what was happening at 3 o'clock on Friday, the day that Jesus died? This is the exact same time that the Passover lambs are being sacrificed. Why is that significant? Because what Jesus, what, what God is saying through the death of Jesus at three o'clock in the afternoon is this. The sacrifices that are taking place are over. You don't need to do that anymore because my Passover lamb is being sacrificed. There's no more need for those sacrifices. There's no more need for going back to the temple. No more need for sacrificing your animals because the ultimate sacrifice has been made. And then the third point, remember what happened at three o'clock when Jesus died? Remember the curtain was torn in two? What is that saying? What is that saying? is saying that the old way that God was doing things is over now. 
that before there was only one man who could go into God's presence once a year through a whole bunch of sacrifices. Now, the ultimate sacrifice has been made so that anybody, like we, like we just saw in this passage right here, so that all the nations of the earth can be blessed now, so that anybody can have access to God. Why? Because the old has passed away and the new has come in Christ. And what, a fourth thing that I just thought of, there's a fourth thing that tells you that the, new, the old covenant is over and the new covenant has began and it happened the moment Jesus died as well. If you take a look at Mark, Mark is the only one that says this, I think. When Jesus died, there was a centurion there, a Roman centurion. You remember what he said? He looked at Jesus and he said, right, surely this man is the son of God, right? That is significant. You know why? Because he was a Gentile. Why? Because the blessing of Abraham began in that moment when a non-Jewish person, a Gentile, believed in Jesus and was saved. So all of that points to the fact that this law is temporary. It was never meant to be eternal. So the law is inferior because it's temporary, but there's more. Look at verse 19 again. So why then the law? Look at the, towards the end of verse 19. It, that is the law, was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. I don't even know who John Piper is. John Piper, when he preached on verse 20, told his congregation, thousands of people, um, we're not going to preach on verse 20 today because I have no idea what it means. So we're going to go where angels dare to tread right now. And it it's actually could be a sign of my foolishness because I read one guy who said there are 450 interpretations that he counted of verse 20. We're just going to look at like 275, okay? So <laughs> is ready? No? Just kidding. That'd be a little too stretching. But Paul's next point here is that the law is inferior to, the, to grace because the law was given indirectly. So the law is inferior because it's temporary. It's inferior because of how it was given. Look at verse 19. The law was given by God, right, to the people? Is that what it says? No, it says it was given by God to angels, then to an intermediary. So the point is that God did not give the, the covenant with Moses directly to the people. The people got it from Moses, who got it from angels, who got it from God. Okay, so God gave it as a superior to inferiors. I can't give this directly to you. I'm going to give this through an intermediary. And if you read the passage, there's thunder and lightning and terror. The people are just scared out of their minds when, 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 when God gives the covenant to Moses. However, well, there's a clear distance between God and the people in that one. However, when... God gave the covenant to Abraham, as we read. He was, verse 20, one. What do I think that means? I think it means that he was alone. The law is inferior because God gave the promises directly to Abraham as a friend. No intermediaries, no one in between God and Abraham. God gave it to him alone. I think John MacArthur captures this when he said, quote, the promise of salvation by faith was so precious to the heart of God that he gave it to Abraham in person. He didn't stand above, freak everyone out, and go, you, you're, you better believe this, you better, you better follow this, or you're in trouble. He didn't say any of that to Abraham at all. He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make a great nation out of your descendants. I'm going to give you this great land. And I'm going to, through you, through your descendants, uh, parentheses as through your descendant, I'm going to bless the world. Everything that God said, I will, I will, and he said it directly. So if you're, if you're sitting there wondering like, uh, angels gave the law, like, where's that in the old Testament? It's not there. I, I can't find it. Let's put it that way. Neither could all the, the 25 guys that I read either. It's not, it's not in the old Testament. There are a couple of hints in Psalm 68 and Deuteronomy 33, but there are twice in the New Testament where it says this. Acts 7.53, Hebrews 2.2 2 actually teaches that the law was given through angels. And so the point there is, though, that it's God's way of saying this is, not as, this is not as powerful, this is inferior to my promise with Abraham. So after all that, law is definitely inferior to the promises. But did you catch why God gave the law in the first place? Look at 19 again. I read through it really fast because I didn't want you to see it, but I want you to see it now. 
Galatians 3.19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Added because of transgressions. This phrase means, was added to increase sin. So I want you to think about transgressions. Transgressions are the crossing of a boundary. So without the law, there were no boundaries. There were just boundaries inside of us, in our conscience. That's all that was there. And our consciences can be misinformed and seared. And, and so it wasn't, it, it wasn't as effective. But when law shows up, now we know sin. When the, when, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So when, when the covenant with Abraham comes out and there's all of these rules, 613 of them, and they're all written down, no more excuses. Now everyone knows when they cross God's boundaries. Now people are conscious of their violations. Sin is now obvious. No one can claim ignorance because everything is, is there in black and white. And the same thing is true for us, right? Law is written in black and white for us. We have no excuses. We can't claim ignorance. Every time we cross God's moral boundaries, it's now obvious, obvious to us. Because the law is a mirror, right? Now, except for, except for like one or two of you, I don't think any of you left your house today without looking in the mirror, right? You all, you all looked in the mirror, right? Now, I don't want to start a fight between husband and wife, but like some of you might have stayed a little too long in front of that mirror, and that's why you're late this morning, Right? When you think about a mirror, though, a mirror simply shows you what's there, right? Doesn't change anything, doesn't fix anything. Looking in the mirror, wasn't that like nice at one point in your life? I like, it was nice at one, like 20 years ago. Like, oh, not so bad looking. Yeah, not so much now. This is the way it goes. But the law, the, the law can't, the, the mirror doesn't change anything. You can't like, hey, I got to clean the mirror a little bit to make myself look better. Like that doesn't work, right? And that's the point of the law. The law doesn't change you. The law is simply a mirror that tells you who you actually are before God. It has no power to change you. It was never meant to change you. It was to simply reveal what is there. And this is why people avoid the law even today. Because it makes us feel bad. Because of the sin that we see there. But, if, but here's the thing that Paul wants us to know as we, as we come to the end of this passage. If we don't look at the law, we are going to miss out on grace. At this point, you might think that the law and the promises are opposed to each other. Law and grace are opposed to each other, that they are enemies, but that's not true. Look at verse 21. Is the law then contrary? Is it opposed? Is it an enemy to the promises of God? You would expect him to say yes, but he says certainly not. For if the law had been given that would give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Paul's argument there is it, they, they would be in conflict. If the law was a second way to salvation, if you could earn your salvation by your good deeds and you could earn your salvation by faith in Christ, then yes, they would be at odds with each other. But what does he say? He says, no. Verse 22, the scriptures imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So what we see here is not the hostility between grace and law. What we see here, point number three, is the synergy of grace and law. The synergy between grace and law. You see, law and grace should be enemies. Like I said, if the law was the second way to be saved, but it's not. The law is there to show you you need Christ. Right? Before the law, all pretenses are gone, all excuses are gone. All, in the Old Testament, all my animals are gone, right? I'm constantly in the sacrifice line, and so are all of you. The law told people how to live, but it offered no help. It, it couldn't give life. It couldn't even give the power. It couldn't even give the desire to do right. With the law, everything is black and white. Everything is past fail. To live under the law is to crush any hope of salvation. That's the point. This is how the law works in synergy with grace. The purpose of law is to increase sin in your heart and mind. It's to increase it to such a level that it breaks us so that when we see ourselves in the mirror of God's law, we go, I am in trouble. I don't need works. I need grace. I need forgiveness. It makes us cry out for grace, right? Because, because grace means nothing to somebody who thinks that they're good, right? It means nothing. Forgiveness is nothing to a person who thinks that they, you know, they, they, they're good enough. Being saved means nothing to a person that doesn't think they're lost. So how does a person realize that they need grace and forgiveness and salvation and mercy? 
do they realize that by me sent, coming up here and saying, you know, I know your life isn't working out good, but God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. According to Paul, the way that you understand that you need grace and mercy is by me telling you the law. So let's do it for a second, okay? Let's, think about, let's go to the Ten Commandments for a second, okay? Let's compare our lives to the Ten Commandments. Let's start with the third one. You ever taken God's name in vain? Treated, used, used God's name as a cuss word, treated him beneath the respect that he deserves as your creator, the one who gives you life and breath and everything else? How many times do you think you've done that? I just had one bad day, you know, one, one time, kind of slipped out, I didn't mean, probably hundreds of times if we're honest, right? Maybe thousands. Let's go to the fifth commandment. You ever dishonored your parents? Treated them disrespectfully, disobeyed them, treated their words, treated what they want as uh, beneath what you want, and so you're going to do what you want instead of what they want. You ever do that? How many times? I just had a bad day when I was four. But from that moment on, like, I've been good to go. No. How many times do you think you broke the fifth commandment? Hundreds? How about the eighth commandment? You ever stolen anything? Even something small? No, I never did that. Well, let's look at the ninth commandment. Have you ever told a lie? <laughs> you, you may just have, right? Even a white lie. So how many times do you think you've done that? Hundreds of times? Thousands of times? So you're going to stand before God, having just admitted to tens, hundreds, maybe even tens of thousands of violations of God's law after looking at just four of the Ten Commandments. So just based on what we saw, you're going to stand before God as a lying, thieving, parent-dishonoring blasphemer, not to mention everything else that you've done that we didn't even look at in the other laws. What could you possibly say to God now on Judgment Day? Well, I'm a good person. That's laughable, right? That's why you're laughing. Because that's the point of the law. It is to make us laugh at the idea that we are good enough for God to accept us so that we cry out for mercy and run to Jesus. The law, verse 22, notice, it imprisons you. It puts you in a dungeon. It locks you up with your own life and gives you no way to escape. There's no exit with the law. There's no getaway car. There's no like weakness in the defenses so that you can make so it makes it possible for you to get yourself free. The law is black and white. You did the crime. You do the time. The law is meant to show you that you and I are like, like men on death row. There is no hope. There, we are in trouble and there is no escape. You will stand before God and you will be found guilty. And most people in church today are asleep to this reality. They are guilty, cursed, awaiting the certainty of judgment, punishment, and eternal hell. And they will recognize, and here's just the thing. They will recognize that all of that is true about them when they stand before God and he just puts his law next to them. And they will say, this, I deserve the punishment that I'm going to get because I have broken that law. They will embrace that and say, that is true about me because no one will ever say to God that what he is doing is unfair and not right. They will embrace it and say, that is true of me and I deserve my punishment. In works, there is no hope of freedom, but through grace, verse 22, the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Here's the synergy. The law shows us the beauty of grace. It shows you your need for a savior and sets you free from the thousands and thousands of sins against the law that, that, that the law has graciously shown us. The law gives the inheritance, verse 18. The law gives life, verse 21. Grace gives everything people go to the law for, but grace will give it to you after the law has had its way with your self-image, revealing the truth about you to drive you to grace. Verse 22, the gift, verse 22, the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So this passage ends by putting all of us in a dilemma. And the dilemma is, why would you go to Moses when you could have Abraham? Why would you go to Moses when you could have Abraham's descendant, Jesus? What is, what is this complexity stretching us and leaving us with? What are we equipped to help people see now? Well, here's what we help them see. Why would you turn to the law to try to earn a salvation that you can never earn when you can have promises given by grace that can set you free? 
Why would you trust in works which you will fail to accomplish when you can be shown grace? Why would you give yourself to doing and doing and doing with no hope of rescue when you can just believe and have everything? Grace is about believing that Jesus earned your salvation because he lived and died and rose again as your substitute. Law is about doing works that are never done to earn a salvation that you can never achieve because it demands perfection. So in the end, your hope is either in, in you or your hope is in Christ. And here, this message is screaming at us, do not stand before God on the basis of law. Do not think of yourself as accepted by God because you are a good person. Because the law says you and I are not good people. Stand before him on the basis of faith in the only one that can rescue from the sentence of the law. And the only one, like we saw in that survey, that can give you everything you need to get into heaven. Trust in Christ, not yourself. That is the message of this very stretching, complex, but really rather simple argument that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's pray. God, we are prone to wander from this truth. We are prone to wander. I am prone to wander from this. I think that because I'm a pastor and preach your word, that that somehow gets me like a higher level of heaven and more acceptance from you. That is a lie. But by faith in Christ, we are just as accepted by you as if our name was Jesus. And please protect our hearts from seeking to earn our acceptance with you or keep our acceptance with you based on our good works and equip us. Use this passage today. Use the argument that you wanted us to know in this passage. Use this argument to help us help those who we know and love who are hoping to be good enough to earn your salvation. Please do these things, I pray in Jesus' name.